we're live. Right, we're on. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Mary, you're going to kick us off. Yes, good evening, and you're all very, very welcome to the first of our online talks for Rhododendron Week. Um, my name is Mary O'Neill Maloney. I'm the head guide here at the National Botanic Gardens in Pernicola. Um, I'm also a horticulturalist having trained at the National Bot Botanic Gardens in Dublin. Rhododendrons, I suppose, have always had a very special place in my heart and since I was quite young. And it's, it's so great that we can now create this new annual event, Rhododendron Week. And as we all see, like every, everything is online this year. So we really do hope that you will all be able to join us in person next year. So we're delighted to introduce Dr. Matthew Jebb, Director of the National Botanic Gardens, who's going to be uh, giving a wonderful talk this evening. One thing I'd like to do is give a shout out to all my wonderful OPW colleagues who have just done amazing work putting all these online events together. And I would urge you to go to the YouTube channel, the National Botanic Gardens YouTube channel, to have a look at um, all the video stories. And this year as well, we're delighted to be collaborating with the RHS Rhododendron Camellia and Magnolia Group. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Matthew, and we're really looking talk to you, looking forward to your talk this evening, Matthew. Thank you, Mary. Um, the title of my talk is A Family History, and this encompasses actually a number of families, but the particular one at its heart is the Acton family of Kilmacara. Uh, Kilmacara House is a, an, an extraordinary structure begun in the uh, right at the end of the 17th century. The landscape around the house uh, was a classical 18th and then a 19th century landscape garden. It borrowed from the surrounding landscape. And the beauty of the site today is that we have a, a garden there, we have trees there that date back a nice 200 years uh, demonstrating this continuity. So whilst Kilmacara has only been part of the National Botanic Gardens um, by name in the last uh, 10 or so years. Its actual history uh, with the National Botanic Gardens goes back 160 years to the time of Thomas Acton and the Moore family of Glasnevin. Seen from the air, and this is a, a drone photograph I took a few weeks ago, you can see over the walled garden just to the left there, the big Magnolia Campbellii in full bloom at the time. There, right at the top of the screen, is the somewhat derelict house that we always keep our fingers crossed that we will be restoring in the next few years. Uh, there is a golden opportunity now to at least uh, strengthen and consolidate what remains of that house. But surrounding it, and here in this view, we get this wonderful view of the Arboretum behind the house, the work largely of Thomas and Janet Acton from the 1850s through the starting years of the 20th century, which has got a spellbinding collection of trees, extraordinary conifers, but the, the real showstoppers are the rhododendrons, and you can see them just coming into bloom there in that photograph. The moment you enter the drive at Kilmacara, you are met at this time of year just to the left by these extraordinary tree-sized rhododendrons. These are an extraordinary hybrid, Rhododendron Clarensi, which was first bred by Lord Carnarvon at Highclere Castle uh, over in Britain. And Lord Carnarvon, uh, when he first received Rhododendron Arboreum from the Himalayas, he was interested in how could he make it uh, a hardier, plant? How could he breed it so that it could grow in the colder parts of these islands? And so with a number of other colleagues, he had started hybridization with uh, various American rhododendrons. Uh, in the end, it was a, a hybrid of uh, Catorbiensi and Ponticum that hybridized with rhododendron arboreum to produce this Alta Clarensi, a blood red flower and a reasonably hardy plant. Not hardy in colder parts of these islands, 
but by and large an, a garden like Kilmacara is absolutely suited to it. Uh, what is interesting about Rhododendron arboreum is it has been grown in these islands for over 200 years. It was one of the earliest uh, rhododendron introductions from the uh, Him Himalayas and the point of it is it is a very widespread species. It has both got a large altitudinal gradient from a thousand meters right up to 3,000 meters and it is far found as far south as Sri Lanka and the hills in the southern states of India. So it's a widespread species and very variable and therefore it was something that attracted the attention of these early growers because here were vast tree-like rhododendrons uh, that would really improve the shrubby rhododendrons that people had gotten used to at that point. When these Altaclarenses shed their flowers, their petals in the uh, later part of April, they make a spectacular sight at Kilmakara. And it's one of the great features of the garden that whilst it's wonderful to see the the blooms on the trees, when they drop down onto this broad walk behind the house, they make a truly breathtaking spectacle. Here are a number of the rhododendron arboreum. So this is one of the parents of the Altaclarensi, and arboreum is characterized in its uh, true state with a silvery underside to the leaf, quite a small leaf compared to the much larger leaf of Altaclarensi. But th these three trees that you're looking at in this image, they are all rhododendron arboreum and they are various subspecies, varieties and cultivars of it. So it's a very variable plant and we are fortunate at Kilmakara to have a great range of them growing there. Now here is the, the architect, if you like, of the modern day National Botanic Gardens Kilmakara. So this is Thomas Acton. He was one of the uh, greatest gardeners of the Acton family and he inherited the estate in the 1850s from his father and it was his brother's sons who in turn inherited over the years of the Great War. And that is where a lot of the tragedy of Kilmacurra lies. But our story tonight is about the family connection of Thomas Acton in inheriting this estate in the 1850s, what to do with it, what to plant in it, and how to build up the gardens. Along with his sister, Janet, he was a uh, extremely keen horticulturalist, and he went on a global trip with his sister around the world to look at a lot of these plants in their natural habitats. And this is a very important part of any horticulturalist's education, which is to see the plants you're trying to grow where they live in their, their native haunts, because this informs you of the best way to grow them. And one of the wonderful stories of Thomas Acton is, yes, he, he sought advice from people, but he had a rule of thumb. And his rule of thumb was that, yes, he would put a plant where others suggested it would grow best. He would also put a second plant where he thought it would grow best. And thirdly, he would put a plant where he was advised not to grow it by others. Because horticulture is an experimental art. One is constantly testing whether things will grow and your own local conditions are often extremely important in this regard. Thomas and Janet befriended a great deal of the uh, people involved with some of the tree introductions at the end of the 19th century, including Augustin Henry, who's seen in the middle here between Janet and Thomas, out in the deer park at Kilmacurra, where they are looking at some of the extraordinary elder trees that grow there in the swampy ground. Augustin Henry spent uh, 19 years out in China. He had an enormous knowledge of plants, that in his latter years were being introduced to our gardens. So he had the opportunity again with that field knowledge to give people advice about the best way to grow these things. He was also the professor of forestry at, at the College of Science, latter, uh, later on to become the University College of Dublin. Kilmacurra Garden has always been 
a Robinsonian garden. It is surrounded by lawns, great meadows that surround the house, large vistas, woodland plantings, and open rides. And it gives it a wonderful naturalistic feel. And during the 18th century, 19th century, these gardens were commonplace in, in North County Wicklow. A lot of the big houses had gardens of a similar nature and style. They were not gardens that were filled with rose beds and serried ranks of uh, annual plantings. They were natural meadows. They were naturalized bulbs out into uh, grassy glades and rides and woodland settings. So in order to beautify this garden, Thomas uh, Acton realized he needed the assistance of others. And a family he particularly turned to was David Moore, who was then the curator, uh, essentially what is today uh, my role here at Glasnevin. David Moore had uh, begun his tenure here at Glasnevin in 1838. So he was already a very knowledgeable horticulturalist and estate planner. He had a lot of friends across the country and in very short order, uh, Thomas Acton and Janet Acton were being visited by David Moore, who gave them advice on their gardens. And in 1879, when David Moore died, his son, Frederick Moore, uh, took on another 40 year dynasty. So between father and son for 84 years, the Moores ran Glasnevin. And Frederick Moore, in particular, was an extraordinary character. He was a giant amongst horticulturalists in his day. And in his obituary written by Robert Lloyd Prager, Robert Lloyd Prager referred to him as a tower of strength, a tower of strength to uh, friends and gardeners across the island of Ireland. He would, for example, have been staying at Ansgrove with the Grove Annesley family, uh, Mount Usher, the Walpole family of Mount Usher, the Bryces on Ilna Cullen, uh, Armitage Moor at Rowallan, and Lord Hedford up at Kells. And indeed, the Acton family were particularly close with the Moors through father and son. Uh, Frederick Moore was a regular visitor to Kilmacurra. And not only did he give advice on what to plant there, but he also gave them a great number of plants. And this encouragement of private uh, plant collections right across the island was of enormous benefit to Frederick Moore because he had a garden here at Glasnevin that was a, a dry uh, gravelly ridge near the Tolka River prone to frosts and in many ways one of the last places you would have thought of establishing a botanic gardens. So to him Kilmacurra was heaven sent in terms of Kilmacurra had a rainfall twice that of Glasnevin it had acidic soils and it had a climate overlooking the Irish Sea that was incredibly maritime and mild. And this suited so many plants that would not have thrived here at Glasnevin. Here's another aerial view of Kilmacurra, the house just over to the right here with the uh, stable yard, the courtyard next to it and the pond down at the bottom of this vista. And I just want to draw your attention to the amount of rhododendron flowers coming out. Up behind the house here, they're mostly the Alta Clarensis, but elsewhere, these white, pink, uh, and pale pink and reds are mostly of rhododendron arboreum. But if you look here, just towards the back of the arboretum, you can see a tree with huge white blooms on it. Oh, there we go. Don't know where that happened, sorry. Um, Zooming in on it, there is this phenomenal tree, a 35 foot tall rhododendron grandi. And here for scale is Seamus O'Brien, our head, guide, uh, head gardener there at uh, Kilmacurra, standing amongst its multiple trunks at the base. This is as big as this tree grows in the wild in the Himalaya ranges. This is one of the staggering sights to be seen up at two and a half to three thousand meters, rhododendron, rhododendron grandi forests uh, form this solid canopy. So here is one of the biggest uh, trees of its kind in these islands, 
and it indicates just how amenable Kilmakara is to these Himalayan plants. Now, what's important about this is that these trees date from their first introduction. So when rhododendron uh, grandi was first discovered by one of Wallach's collectors in the Himalaya ranges, it was rediscovered, if you like, by Joseph Hooker later on. And for many years, we've often referred in the literature to this species as rhododendron argentia because of its silver undersides to its leaves. But it is one of the examples of the rhododendron forest of the Himalaya range that so impressed many of the early collectors visiting this range. In close up, the, the flower trusses are enormous. They're almost a foot across these big cup shaped flowers with a dark base and these pendulous leaves common to so many rhododendron and the smooth brown reddish bark. But what's fantastic about that tree that Seamus is standing under is that we know precisely where it came from. We have good records here at the National Botanic Gardens up in Glasnevin of all the donations we re have received over the years, as well as the plants that we have distributed to other gardens. And here in April of 1850, we can see a number of accessions that arrived here at Glasnevin. Amongst them, 79 packages of seeds from the Himalaya, and those came from uh, Major Madden, who was in the Royal Bengal Artillery. Edward Madden was somebody who sent us a huge number of packets of seeds. I think there are some 30 uh, con consignments in total that appear over many years. He did four tours of duty out in northern India and wherever the opportunity arose he was out there in the, what is today the modern uh, area of Nepal but also up in the west Himalaya ranges of northern India. But also underneath that you can see another dated uh, arrival on the 22nd of April from the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew come 18 papers uh, of seeds of Sikkim rhododendrons. Now, Sikkim is one of these extraordinary uh, states up in northern India. It is nestled very tightly between Nepal and Bhutan, and it is a, a part of the Himalaya that was uh, astonishing for a number of reasons. It was the opening an opportunity to discover a huge number of new species that fell upon the shoulders of a, a young Joseph Hooker. But to get to that story, we start here in 1850. So in April the 22nd, uh, 1850, these packets of seeds arrived here in Glasnevin. They would have been grown in the curvilinear range and for the next dozen years or so, David Moore carefully cultivated these plants uh, under glass. The reason being, nobody was too sure how well these would survive out of doors. So whilst they're coming from the highest mountains on earth, they are coming from middle latitudes. Um, the altitude range that we're looking at from 1,000 to 3,000 meters changes from a semi-tropical uh, climate to almost an alpine climate. And where these particular seeds were collected, it was very important to adjust the conditions. Any plant will suffer if it is grown too warm or if it is go grown too cold. So one's knowledge of where these plants came from was very important. Now, Thomas Acton at this point had already been in um, collaboration with David Moore for some years. But when you think of this date, 1850, another extraordinary publication came out and it was printed from uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew and Thomas Acton almost certainly got an early copy of it. And this was a book called The Rhododendrons of the Sikkim Himalaya. These were plants seen by J.D. Hooker, Joseph Dalton Hooker, in the uh, province of Sikkim, the, the state of Sikkim in northern India. And it is a phenomenal book. Uh, it contains 30 species illustrated at life size. So this is a huge folio book 
Uh, Rhododendron falconeri is something that we used to grow in Kilmacara from original hooker seed. It has sadly since succumbed in a big storm. But to demonstrate the, the size of this book, this is a folio edition and the plant is painted at full size. The leaves of falconeri are one foot to 14 inches in length. And here is, uh, you can see at the bottom here, note the 12 inch ruler, the 30 centimeter rule there. You can see the size of these leaves. These are actual falconeri leaves and I've laid them on the interleaving sheet right opposite the plate of rhododendron falconeri to show you how sumptuous this book is, how phenomenal it would have been that uh, Thomas Acton would be sitting in his library, leafing over this huge folio volume of wonderful rhododendrons from Sikkim. Now, these rhododendrons were, the, the whole idea of the Sikkim Himalaya was really down to William Hooker, who was director of Kew at the time. So William Jackson Hooker had been the uh, professor of botany up at Glasgow University. And in 1841, he took on the directorship of Kew. Now, one thing to point out is between them, uh, father and son, so Joseph Hooker, uh, who succeeded his father, between them, they only managed a, a, something like 40 odd years uh, running Q, com contrasting with the Moore family, who ran Glasnevin for 84 years between them. Nonetheless, William Hooker realized his son was out in the uh, Sikkim. He was doing his travels and he was sending back extraordinary notes, dried plant material. And William Hooker was anxious to further young Joseph's career. Joseph Hooker at this time would have been uh, just on around 30, 29, 30 years old when he went out to seek him. He spent four years there collecting plants, making phenomenal observations. And all of this is carefully written down uh, in, in journals he, he kept, the Himalayan journals of his travels. In addition to that, he took meticulous notes. And like his father, he was an incredibly skilled draftsman. So William Hooker realized with the notes coming back from his son in India that he should publish them. He should publish them so that by the time Joseph Hooker returned to Britain, this extraordinary volume of Sikkim uh, rhododendrons would have been published. So whilst Joseph Hooker was still in Sikkim, the first few uh, folios of this enor enormous book appeared. Now, some 30 years later, it was Marianne North this extraordinary artist whose legacy of botanical and landscape art is housed at Kew to this day. Um, and here she has painted a site in Darjeeling, which would have been almost exactly what Joseph Hooker would have seen 30 years beforehand. Uh, the Kachen Chunga, which is that huge peak there, is the uh, third highest mountain on earth. And it is at a distance of 50 kilometers from Darjeeling. Any of you who have been to northern India, Nepal, Bhutan, and gazed upon the Himalaya mountains will realize that they look as though they are just a few miles distant. And it is an extraordinary optical illusion, the clarity of the air, the sheer scale of these mountains, that mountains sitting 50 kilometers away from the viewer as Marianne North has captured there, seem to occupy the entire horizon and half the sky. They really are mighty peaks. And those forests that you can see on the foothills of the Himalaya in the distance there, clothed in rhododendron forests. One of the delights of this huge volume about the rhododendrons is Joseph Hooker, who prior to this trip to the Indian subcontinent, uh, had accompanied Captain Ross on the uh, expedition around the Antarctic and had built up a, a flora of Antarctica uh, on that voyage in the little stops that they'd made on various islands. And also before he left Britain, Joseph Hooker had established a cordial relationship 
with Charles Darwin. So Hooker was later to become one of Charles Darwin's greatest uh, supporters in encouraging him to produce and publish The Origin of Species. So Joseph Hooker would have been one of these fortunate people who had a very clear understanding of what Charles Darwin's theory about evolution meant in the real biological world. But waking up at Darjeeling, he had seen nothing on his arrival because of the clouds and the mists and the rain falling. And then the following day when uh, the clouds had lifted and this extraordinary sight of the mountains beyond would have taken his breath away, as he said. Joseph Hooker was an excellent drafts person. You can see his skill with botanical art, but he was also a cartographer. And he did a great deal of work at ascertaining what altitude he was at. And he was constantly taking the temperature of the soil, not only the soil surface, but below soil level. These were to prove vital bits of information on how to grow these plants later on. So you can see well, while he was out there in the Himalaya, he would be painting these watercolors in his tent in the evening, capturing those colors. He didn't need to color the whole thing. He just needed to send back sufficient information to Q so that he could recreate uh, what these plants look like in the wild. Now, here are the original specimens, uh, and they come from the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, the herbarium there. This is Rhododendron argentium, grande, which was the big tree with the white flowers I showed you earlier on. This is the kind of material that ends up in a herbarium. It is all brown, you can see the amount of soot that has entered the edges of the cupboards. This is from um, close on 160 years of pollution in London, literally uh, coal smoke that has entered the herbarium building right through the 19th and early 20th century and uh, dirted the herbarium specimens. How from that would you produce a good uh, painting as in that uh, Sikkim rhododendron book? So there's the original um, label, the little ticket on the specimen explaining that this is rhododendron argentium collected by J.D. Hooker, J.D.H., between eight to 10,000 feet of altitude. This is how that rhododendron argentium appeared in his Sikkim rhododendrons. And you will have to admit it is astonishing that from those brown scrappy specimens, the original little field sketches of Joseph Hooker, that that plate was prepared. And that plate was prepared long before Joseph Hooker had returned from uh, the Himalayas. And it was indeed, it was published at that point. And the skillful lithographer, the person who had did all that work, is someone who goes by the name of Walter Hood Fitch. Walter Fitch was a phenomenon. At the age of 17, he came to the attention of William Hooker up in Glasgow, where he was a textile designer. But what um, William Hooker realized was that Fitch had a, a skill of um, engraving on stone or drawing, if you like, with a greasy pencil on a huge lithographic stone for printing, an amazing skill. And this is the very first plate that Walter Fitch did at the age of 17. He prepared a lithographic plate. A lithographic plate is a very fine limestone rock on which is drawn with a, a greasy pencil the outline of the uh, image you want to produce. So it is printing a black and white uh, outline that is then going to be colored in by hand. So this plate has been colored in by hand after the printing of the, um, the plate that's been done by Fitch's hand. So this, is, this particular image comes from uh, one of the most extraordinary journals. It's called Curtis's Botanical Magazine. It's been running for hundreds of years. And um, Walter Fitch was to go on to produce something like 3,000 images for the Curtis Bot Mag the editorship have fallen to William Hooker. So William Hooker, if you like, had brought this uh, journal originally produced by Mr. Curtis. He brought it from Glasgow to Kew and it has found its home at Kew ever since. 
So this skill of preparing the lithographic plate so that you could print hundreds of copies of identical outlines of the plant and then have them hand colored in. And yet you were dealing with plant material that looked like this. So this is falconeri, uh, the plant I was showing you earlier on, and I'm going to show it to you again. But falconeri was one of the uh, new species that Hooker discovered in Sikkim. And whilst making a herbarium specimen was important so that you could actually look at the microscopic features uh, down a microscope, under a hand lens, you can measure the dimension of stems and leaves and twigs. You always lack color. You lack, well, what did that plant look like in the field? So before the advent of color photography, what Joseph Hooker would have done is prepared this wonderful sketch on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side is the sketch that Hooker made in the uh, Himalaya mountains, probably under canvas in a tent where he had been walking for several days. Somebody would have been cooking up the rice for the evening meal. And Joseph Hooker would have carefully sketched in some of the color features and the essential features of parts of that inflorescence. On the right-hand side is what was printed in the Sikkim Rhododendron book. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that the two are a perfect mirror image. If you look at that big PTO from Hooker's sketch running to the right, you can see in Fitch's lithograph, it runs to the left. You can see the pistol, the, the stigma sticking out of this lower flower on the inflorescence. Here it is over on Fitch's plate. On the bottom left-hand corner of this plate, it will say JDH Delineat. That is, Joseph Hooker drew this, and Fitch uh, has lithographed it. So Fitch has literally had that sketch in front of him on the left-hand side, and directly onto the stone, he has drawn exactly what he can see. And that skill of copying, it's its almost beautiful how accurate that copying is. He didn't use um, tracing paper. He didn't use careful mirrors or anything. He did it by eye. He did it by eye from Joseph Hooker's field sketch to produce that finished plate that was then printed. And then a team of colorists would carefully color in uh, the same shades that they saw on uh, Joseph Hooker's field sketch. Here is Falconeri uh, photographed at Kilmakara some years ago. So again, th those leaves uh, close on 10, 11 inches in length, the truss of flowers almost a foot across, very similar to uh, Grandi, but the underside of the leaf with this reddish indumentum of hairs. The finished plates, when one looks at them and compares them, so here again is the uh, the Sikkim Him Him Himalaya book opened up with a particular plate of rhododendron Campbelli. Campbelli is named after Archibald Campbell's wife. And when Joseph Hooker was collecting his Sikkim rhododendrons, he was very anxious to honor people who had helped him and given him assistance in India, both in the field, but also for making his uh, passage through um, his arrival and, and movements through India. So this particular plate, named after the wife of Archibald Campbell, was uh, in recognition of the incredible amount of work that Campbell had done in making sure that his, his life was easy and that his plant collecting could go ahead. He also names other plants after those like Madden, Wallich, people who gave him a hand, directed him to this part of the Himalayan range, range that nobody else had collected plants up to that point. And by pure serendipity, it is one of the richest uh, parts of the Himalayan mountains for rhododendrons. It was a, an extraordinary moment in the um, his expeditions up into the mountains in 1849, so uh, some uh, sort of two years after he had first arrived. Uh, he found himself um, in a, an awkward situation, uh, literally a hostage situation. At Tumlong, 
um, a, a local ruler had decided that Campbell and himself should not be there. They should not be trespassing in these northern parts of Sikkim, uh, right near, close to the borders of Tibet. So they were imprisoned. But Hooker was allowed to travel around, collect plants. And in recognition of that friendship with Campbell, he named this plant after Archibald Campbell's wife. Uh, by a nice sort of twist of history, um, this uh, plant being named after Campbell, it was also a recognition that um, uh, Campbell's daughter, who was born at around this time during this hostage crisis, was named Josephine. Josephine in honor of um, Joseph Hooker. So it's a nice bit of uh, reciprocity that he named this plant after her and she named her daughter after him. When you look at these two plants laid side by side, you can see this, uh, amongst other features, do you see the upside down leaf on the left hand side? It's got a brownish reddish indumentum. Uh, and this is what uh, Joseph Hooker realized made it different from Rhododendron arboreum. In fact, today we now know that uh, this species of plant is actually part of a big species complex of arboreum. So it joins the, the species arboreum, but as subspecies, um, because of its underside of its leaves, cinnamomum with that reddish brown color, and it falls into the group Campbelli. So her name still exists on this plant. Um, and the real reason for showing it, it to you is how beautifully those plates done by Fitch, who never saw these plants um, in, in life. He was just basing these upon Hooker's sketches and the scrappy brown leaves that he would receive at Kew. Um, it is amazing what he achieved. Now, some plants, that some rhododendrons that Hooker introduced at that time, both as seed, but also as descriptions and new names, he never saw the flowers. This is rhododendron nivium. Now, the flowering of rhododendrons, as we know, is all too fleeting. It's a brief moment in April with us when they are in bloom. Out in the Himalaya range, there is a lovely big succession of flowering that travels up the mountain, if you like. Spring comes to the lower slopes first. So there is a, a constant um, wave of flowering that you'll see in the foothills of the Himalaya range that we probably don't get in our own gardens because everything is... Uh, experiencing spring at the same time. So Nivium was named on account of the snow white undersides of the leaves there. Um, and it produces quite a, a striking uh, purple colored flower uh, head. And that's that's about two hands clasped together. Gives you an idea of the size of the uh, Nivium inflorescence. There it is flowering at Kilmakara. But it was something that Hooker never saw during his travels. But he would have seen it later on. Now, when Joseph Hooker returned, he had spent the latter year and a bit of his time out in the Himalaya ranges collecting as many seeds as he could. So as, as well as this enormous work of the Sikkim uh, rhododendrons appearing with 30 wonderful plates, many of them new species, he had sent vast quantities of packets of seeds. So in 1850, when we received our packet of seed here, it was one that Joseph Hooker had sent to his father at Kew, and his father in turn had not only sown it and, and germinated them there at Kew, but he also sent it to gardens throughout Britain and Ireland. The reason being that, as any horticulturalist know, where your garden is, is vital to whether you will be able to grow certain plants. Both the soil and climate are incredibly significant features of the chance of growing a plant uh, to maturity. One of the things that Joseph Hooker's realized when he got back, there's, yes, some places had done very well at germinating and growing his plants, and in others, they had all died. And he realized that a lot of these people were not paying attention. They were saying, well, these have come from India. I'll keep them in the hothouse. When you look at what David Moore had done, yes, he, he raised them in a cool glass house, but he dispatched them down to Kilmakara because he knew that these were plants that could probably survive in the outdoors at Kilmakara. The climate would be right. And indeed, in the um, some 
five or six years after doing that, David Moore was able to write to Joseph Hooker back at Kew at the time and director at that point. And he said, you know, I've just been in Wicklow and I've seen one dozen of your species thriving there. So Kilmacurra was clearly a home from home for these plants. It is as if a little bit of the Sikkim uh, climate and conditions have been perfectly matched there on the foothills of the Wicklow Mountains. But he throws these notes together. As you see, Joseph Hooker publishes in the Royal Horticultural Society's um, newsletter information on facilitating the cultivation of these plants. And he threw it together because he was very anxious not to lose out on them. But what is fascinating about this paper is he also goes on to address an issue that is raised. We were looking a moment ago at that rhododendron campbellii with its wonderful pinkish white flowers. Um, there is variation in what that has now ended up in rhododendron arboreum is a hugely varied species. Now, Joseph Hooker was a confidant of Charles Darwin, and he recognized that the sniping going on, the suggestion that some of this new species he had brought back from uh, the Himalaya might have been hybrid swarms. And he addresses this at some length in this paper. And it's very interesting to see somebody who has clearly been strongly influenced by Charles Darwin, but Darwin had yet to publish his theory. So Joseph Hooker is, is balancing his discussions of what a species is and what variation, natural variation, one can expect in the wild. And it makes for a very good read. He also gives a lot of details of where these plants were collected. So by providing details about altitude, soil temperatures, he is able to give people a clear idea of what they should be, where they should be planting their plants, where these rhododendrons are going to grow best. And indeed, we know that they've survived best in Devon, Cornwall, um, the west coast of Britain, but also there in Kilmacurra, they have thrived extraordinarily well. So we're, we're still seeing them there 160 years after they were planted. I just want to show you um, one more uh, plate to, to demonstrate again both Fitch's skill on the right hand side and what he was working from. So there is the field sketch done by Joseph Hooker of Rhododendron barbatum. Now, this was not a new species. It had been described by Wallach, who was uh, the superintendent of the Calcutta Botanic Gardens. And you can see it was named because of these great hairs on the petiole. It, it's bearded. The, the twigs and petiole have got these long black sea toes. They're, they're sort of crisp and, and hard, these little hairs. So Joseph Hooker has again sketched the essential features. And you can see that the, the new uh, growth of, of leaves, which is common to a lot of these big tree rhododendrons, the next flush of leaves is appearing out of the top of the inflorescence almost as soon as flowering is, is over. And because Fitch is making a copy straight onto stone, it is a mirror image of Joseph Hooker's field sketch. And by lovely symmetry, we come to uh, just last year where Seamus uh, O'Brien has published an article on Rhododendron barbatum. And this has been painted by Lynn Stringer from the plant growing or a plant growing in the Kilmacara uh, Arboretum. So this is how Fitch made his living by illustrating Curtis Botanical Magazine for something like 40 years. And here is the modern day artist Lynn Stringer illustrating an article by Seamus O'Brien describing the history of this species, how it entered uh, cultivation. So it is a, a fairly recent reintroduction to Kilmacara that we're growing it there. But it is wonderful to see that history continues, this botanical um, need to illustrate these wonderful plants. The horticulturalist who uh, loves these plants, knows them intimately, is the best person to advise the artist. So in the same way that Joseph Hooker would have sent these sketches back to uh, Fitch, so Seamus has introduced Lynn to the plant in Kilmacara and is able to advise her on the essential features to show.
So there, um, 160 years on, we have got the same process of uh, botanical art continuing. This is another plant that um, Hooker named from the Himalaya ranges, one of the most astonishing of rhubarbs. In the uh, plate to the right, this is Fitch's illustration, and it is, it's been developed from Hooker's field sketch to the left. So you can see where he's cut through one of the stems. Um, he's done various sketches of some of the leaves, and Fitch has carefully copied just on Hooker's sketch, he draws the whole thing. Rium nobile is an amazing rhubarb because the inflorescence towers up high above the uh, rosette of leaves. It forms, if you like, a tent, this translucent tent with the flowers inside. And in, a, in effect, it's like a greenhouse. It warms the flowers, which the scent is released from, and it attracts the pollinating insects. And here is young Seamus. Some years ago, uh, Seamus has been traveling to the uh, China Himalayan ranges for many, many years. Um, and this is him standing next to Riam Nobili. Now a very, very scarce plant because when that plant flowers like that, it can be seen from miles away. And unfortunately, it is regarded as a very significant medicinal plant. So alas, it gets cut down uh, and dried and carted off. And really, Riam Nobili has entered a period of history where it is probably evolving a smaller and smaller inflorescence because those are the only plants that survive on the landscape. Now, many of the stories I'm telling you here tonight can be found in um, Seamus's wonderful book, In the Footsteps of Joseph Hooker. Not surprisingly, and I'm sure many of you will have heard Seamus talking in the past, Seamus uh, was hugely influenced. Once he moved down to Kilmakara some 14 years ago as the head gardener, he uh, would have realized the significance of these big standing rhododendron in the gardens and his opportunity to go and see them in the field was something that he has taken up with relish. Um, and so, you know, that is a heartily recommended book for both the thrill of the plant hunter, but also the, the history of these plants, how they entered cultivation, how they were first unearthed by uh, botanists traveling across the globe. And such adventures continue in our gardens to this day. One of the uh, extraordinary things that Seamus discovered in Kilmakara was this intriguing rhododendron. In order to identify this rhododendron, um, it requires a lot of expertise. And it was only in recent years that Seamus was able to discover that this is a clone of rhododendron. It springs from a hybrid and it came down with the same batch of rhododendron sent from Glasnevin in the 1860s. And this is a hybrid between a rhododendron arboreum, uh, cinnamomium with the brownish reddish undersides to the leaves but it's been crossed with rhododendron campanulatum. And Frederick Moore, on seeing this in the 1880s, suggested to Thomas uh, Acton that it be named after him. So it was named rhododendron Thomas Acton. And alas, it disappeared. It disappeared from our knowledge, albeit it continued to grow there at Kilmacurra. So I should explain that 24 years ago, when the National Botanic Gardens here in Glasnevin was asked to take on the management of Kilmacurra, which some uh, 14 years later was to become the National Botanic Gardens Kilmacurra, the whole gardens had disappeared into a thicket of rhododendron ponticum. This is the highly invasive uh, species that we find in the west of Ireland that has sadly given the genus rhododendron something of a bad name. People on hearing the name or word rhododendron, they say, oh yes, that's a terrible menace in the southwest of Ireland, which Rhododendron ponticum is. However, it is one species amongst a thousand. And of the 180 species that we are currently growing at Kilmacurra, I think there's probably only two or three that regularly throw up little seedlings. The rest, it is a struggle. Very few of them survive. And unless they're mollycoddled and dug up from under the parent tree and grown on, they won't survive. So, you know, ponticum, had invaded Kilmacurra, just as it invades the oak forests around Killarney today. 
And our first head gardener there, Paul Norton, uh, who still works for us here in Glasnevin, uh, spent a, a heroic uh, period of many years battling and excavating Kilmacurra. His work there, um, which was very much a hard labor of 10 years of cutting down rhododendron, ponticum, removing the brambles, clearing out the collection, really revealed once again the beauties of uh, Kilmacurra. But Seamus, on taking over, it was a number of years before he finally got an identification on this plant as the original rhododendron Thomas Acton. So it is wonderful that Thomas Acton's memory is now uh, secure in the cultivar name of this plant, which is being propagated. So again, Seamus has produced many propagations of it, but it was long overlooked. It was long overlooked because there is a blur often uh, in, a, in a collection like that. And once a label is lost, it can be quite an effort to reassign a cultivar name to a plant like that. Back here in, in Glasnevin, we have over the past 20 odd years built up a phenomenal collection of a different group of rhododendron. This is the so-called virea rhododendrons. They differ from the big rhododendron trees of the uh, Himalayan range in that they are much smaller, shrubby things. Many of them are epiphytes. And this one here, rhododendron conori from New Guinea, has a, a flower about, um, it'd be about 12 to 15 centimeters in length with a very heady, fruity scent, is probably pollinated by uh, flying foxes, uh, bats, F nectar feeding bats pollinate this in the forests of New Guinea. These are all reckoned to be fairly tender. The um, mountains of New Guinea have led to this explosion of virea rhododendrons. So whilst we do find them in mountains like Kinabalu on the island of Borneo, this is rhododendron hymentodes, they differ from the uh, other rhododendrons in their features of these scales they have. They're referred to as lepidote. They've got these scales. But the other significant feature of virea rhododendrons is they don't have a little peduncle in their flower. They don't have a central stalk on their inflorescence. All of the flowers arise from an umbel. So these two uh, extraordinary species that we're growing here at Glasnevin represent plants that are probably hardy out of doors in the right place. And with climate change upon us, we are in an era where a lot of these virea rhododendrons, there is the opportunity to trial a lot of them with care down at Kilmacurra. Already we have sent a lot of uh, vireas down to Kilmacurra over the years, but these have not been selected for their altitudinal range. So that's something that we will probably look to investigate in the future and ensure that Kilmacurra will retain into the future that thrill of being a rhododendron paradise, something to go and see. Um, one of the last things I would point out that that great work of the Sikkim rhododendrons is available on the Botanical Heritage Library. You can get it online, you can view these sumptuous plates, and you can go through much the same thrill that uh, Thomas Acton would have done in his library when he reviewed these huge plates. And just 10 years later, with his friendship with the Moore family, he was to receive this, this dozen or more uh, grown trees from Glasnevin that has survived to this day in the gardens of Kilmacurra. So that relationship, that familial relationship between the Moors and the Actons is something that Kilmacurra foundations are built upon. So it is a great pleasure that you know they have fallen back into the, the family of the National Botanic Gardens. And between us, these two gardens represent uh, you know, a wonderful contrast uh, and complementary arrangement of uh, climates and soils. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to stop sharing that and We will pop in, Mary. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was so informative and I just loved every bit of it. There was so much for everyone and it's so good to see we actually have an international audience tuning in here tonight. So 
and we're saying hello to Seamus. Hello, Seamus. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, thanks a million, um, Matthew. Um, Seamus, was there, there was a question there, and I'm just wondering, would you like to answer it for us? Um, is rhododendron cambellii a synonym for rhododendron arboreum? Yeah, it has changed name. As Matthew said, it started its its life at name for Archibald Campbell's wife. Um, nowadays, it's got a long name. So it's Rhododendron Arboreum Subspecies Cinnamomium Campbellier Group. So it is a group that's found in the wild. It's got sort of very definite sort of morphological features that don't vary very a, a great deal across its range. So its current name is it, it sort of ran through, it became Rhododendron Arboreum var Campbellier, but its current name is Rhododendron Arboreum subspecies Cinnamomium. So as Matthew showed with that sort of cinnamon ingementum on the underside of the leaf, but Campbellier group, the flower truss is slightly different to, to the type. That's great. Thanks, Seamus. And just one of the lovely rhododendrons that Matthew was talking about tonight, Rhododendron Grande, is on Seamus's video story. Don't you, you talk about that, Seamus? on your video story which is on the national botanic gardens youtube channel which is you know everybody can go back into yeah 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 i might just quickly mary just to to demonstrate um that that is the variation that you get of rhododendron um arboreum the underside of the leaves ah. very very striking so yeah. it, it was no surprise that the first collectors going out there were looking for these characters um, and it's only once you've got specimens from throughout the range that you realize that everything sort of m melds together, that the further you travel east or west in the range, so one variation merges into the next. So calling them separate species becomes, you know, biologically risky. Mm, yeah. Uh, the, there are birch trees that do the same from one end of the range to the next. They are very, very different appearing trees. And even in the middle, you will get forms with flaky bark that, again, are distinctive. Um, Seamus's book covers all of these matters in, in detail. And it's seeing them in the field that one really gets a handle on just well, that's, how... That's what I was going to say, Matthew. That's perfectly true what you said, because if you're trekking in the Himalaya, and with rhododendron arboreum, if you're down in Darjeeling, you get the silver underleaves. Um, which is Rhododendron arboreum, var arboreum. High altitude, you get the subspecies Cinnamomium, but then actually you get intermediates in between. And really, actually, if you're a lumper, you just call them all Rhododendron arboreum. Yeah, yeah. Just another question in there, Seamus. You might come in on this. Um, somebody's asking, have you a propagation program in place for the Kilmacurra Rhododendron? Now, are they talking about, I wonder, the Alta Clarenci? Thomas, I think probably Thomas Acton, is it? Thomas Acton, yeah, 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 yeah. So we are propagating in a couple of different ways. So some of our species, if they're hand pollinated, we're raising from seed. So Thomas Acton, um, as Matthew said, was lost in the collection for years, for 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 almost a century. So we had it registered with the RHS for the first time last year. So it is uh, an accepted cultivar. Um, so we have sent that to a rhododendron specialist in the UK for propagation. And then in the past, actually, we have propagated some of Joseph Hooker's species. So we have, by cuttings, propagated um, rhododendron arboreum, which, which can be tricky. It takes a long time. You know, it's, a, it's an 18-month job to try and, and propagate it. And we've done some of the old Victorian hybrids as well. So we certainly are between both gardens and with specialist help outside both gardens, we're, we're propagating. Okay, and just do you want to talk about anything that's going on at the moment with present plantings at Kilmacurra, Seamus? Yeah, so one of the great sort of things about Kilmacurra is that it was heavily published in the past. So various different visitors from Kew and from Glasnevin published accounts of the rhododendrons. We've got a very good idea of what was grown and where it came from. So if you just take one example, Mary, um, um, Standish and Noble were one of the major suppliers to the garden. So and they supplied... Um, a whole range of Noblianum cultivars and some of the old Victorian cultivars like Bodertianum. So we've been planting some of the um, the historical cultivars, but we, we're not just resting actually on our history. So we are planting the best of the new species and, and hybrids that are, are entering. So 
cultivation. And as Matthew was saying as well, we are hoping to do a bit of research into the viraeas and just see, you know, what species. Matthew, you've lived in Papua New Guinea, so you've got a better idea of of what species grow at high altitudes. So we're sort of looking into trialing. The, the slight disappointment with with a lot of New Guinea rhododendrons is the flowers are uh, one centimetre long and the leaves half a centimetre. So they a lot of them are miniatures. They, they're alpines in the true sense of the word. They they lack the the grandeur of those rhododendron trees of the uh, Himalayan range. And it's it's very interesting the way um, yes the the viraea rhododendrons are really epiphytes small shrubs they they are mm. the tree line um but but a, a lot of them would be hardy hardiness zone two so you know that they there, would there might there might be um potential maybe for hybridization because there are a few viraea subsection you know rhododendrons in the himalaya like rhododendron vaccinoides that possibly if they were crossed with some of the hardier Malaysian uh, species might create something exciting. Yeah, and certainly viraeas, you know, in, in the Americas, for example, California growers, Florida, um, the Mediterranean, people can grow a great range of viraeas. Uh, just um, another question in from, I'm sure you will all know Miles Reed very well. Ah, yes. Um, a shout out to Miles from all the team at Kilmacurra and the Botanic Gardens in Dublin. He, Miles has a question for you. I think both of you can deal with this. Has the DNA of the original Hugh herbarian specimens been extracted and compared with the DNA of the plants in Kilmacurra? Hmm. <laughs> Any, um, anything you or should we get back to Miles at another time? I mean, the, the, the important thing, one of the things we do in the botanic gardens that sort of distinguishes us from, uh, you know, a, a park or a collection just of plants is that we like to know the provenance. Where did that original packet of seed come from? And if that seed has come from a wild collection, we know that it will be the, the cells of that plant when it grows will have the pure DNA of its ancestry. However, that's not to say that a chance hybridization event didn't happen where you've collected it. And one of the points that uh, Hooker makes in his Royal Horticultural Society thing is the swarms of seedlings. He says, you know, often huge uh, landslides take away the forest and there are thousands of seedlings growing, competing. And he sort of points out that, and, and this clearly was from his discussions with Charles Darwin, that the competition there often will exclude the hybrids. Whereas when we got our precious packet of seed back here in Ireland, we would be tempted to often prick out the, the most vigorous of plants, which have the risk of being hybrids in that they're vigorous. Mm -hmm. no, that's but, but yes, I mean, one can look at the DNA and, and historically we've done this with a number of magnolias, for example, <coughs> um, where we have tried to uh, indicate or, or understand if the trees growing in Kilmacurra are the same packet of seed, if you like, did they originate from the same packet of seed as the trees growing here in Glasnevin or in Burr Castle and so on. So we can use DNA in that way. Yeah, and a comment just in there, what Matthew was, I, I'm, it, I don't see a name on it there, what Matthew was saying, we provenance is very relevant to our talk earlier today by the ecologist Dr. Maria Long on semi-natural grasslands. And also a blog from that came out this week from Dr. Nolene Smith, a conservation botanist of the National Botanic Gardens. Yeah, the point they were making there is, is the danger of um, introducing wildflower seed mixes. One of the things that um, is a phenomenon down at Kilmacurra and, and Seamus will chat about it I hope in a moment is the amazing meadows that uh, through very careful management what Seamus has done is he's rebuilt uh, a meadow which is rich in wildflowers not by sowing in seeds that he's obtained in a shop um, he has done it simply by sowing a parasitic plant in there that has reduced the vigor of the grasses and given the herbs the orchids and so on, the opportunity to grow and not be changed <coughs> their life. So what uh, Maria Long and Nolene Smith were 
emphasizing in their talk today was this notion that actually when we are allowing pollinators to visit our gardens, we don't go and introduce a lot of exotic plants. We allow the dandelions, the daisies, the clovers to feed our pollinators. Mm -hmm. Seamus, you, you can say a bit more about those meadows. I mean, they are something that is one of the great features beyond rhododendrons, another reason to visit Kilmacara. Yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly extends the season, but it's our meadows, it's all down to one little semi-parasitic plant, a rattle. Um, and when we first allowed the, the meadow uh, up uh, from being a closely cropped lawn in 2007, in the first year, it was uh, Yorkshire fog, which is a really heavy, vigorous grass that does not allow an awful lot of wildflowers through it. It's, it's a pest, it's a weed in different parts of the world, particularly in North America. Um, but in the following year, we introduced hay rattle, and within three to four years, it had wiped out Yorkshire fog with all sorts of fine fescues of creeping vents, and then orchids began to appear. So at a last count, the meadow contained 138 species of flowering plants. So, um, and it is much more interesting than having a, a, a sward, a, a fine sward of, of mown grass, which can be pretty boring to look at. And it goes back to how Jonathan Thomas managed the garden uh, during the 19th century. If you look at early photographs of the garden, you can see long grass, and their diaries record when the, when the meadow was mown in front of the house. So. Um, it's a far better way of gardening than having somebody out using fossil fuels to, to, to cut long or short grass, you know, one, once a week. And just um, Charlotte, who's kindly working in the background for us all in Dublin, has put a link up um, for, I think, what was talk going on today. So it's there. And Matthew there, yellow rattle. Yeah. Seeds rattle when the hay is ready to harvest. I love uh, that, that was an old tradition that yeah. when you rattled them and they, they made the noise that, that it was ready to harvest. Because if you leave a hay too too late and it shed its its seed, then the nutrition for the horses or animals you're feeding it to is considerably reduced. Right, but I think I'll bring us back if you don't mind. On yes, let's talk about rhododendrons. Let's talk about <laughs> rhododendrons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just in particular, we. Since we started our online event, um, the amount of visitors we've had this week to um, Kilmacurra has just been amazing. But Seamus, if you want to mention, you know, how the Broadwalk looks at the moment, you know, how beautiful it is with the Alta Carency there. Yeah, well, it's quite easy if you picture a wide Victorian walk with a tunnel of rhododendrons 60 feet arching overhead. And actually, whilst it is spectacular at the moment with the blossoms on the trees, as Patty said earlier, it its most magical time is actually this day next week. And I know I'm going to regret saying that <laughs> because we're now going to be inundated with visitors and uh, problems parking. But um, in about uh, five days, six days, seven days time, all the blossoms or most of the blossoms will fall onto this. It's this great wide Victorian walk um, that was designed in the... In the um, mid-Victorian period, the rhododendrons planted along it in the 1870s. So there we go, you can see it on Mary's screen. And it's it's iconic, it is the most famous rhododendron seen um, on this island. Um, and um, so that, that's really, you know, gives people a good idea of, of of what, what it's like. Um, we like when we get groups of people coming through, particularly Spanish students who have no real interest in, in, in plants um, or rhododendrons to remind them that are you watching Downton Abbey and suddenly there's great interest in the high clear rhododendron. Um, it, it, it is a favourite. Um, it's one of those desert island rhododendrons that rhododendron arboreum can be tricky to grow but this is actually one of the easier rhododendrons to grow. For a castle in the Irish Midlands, it's not particularly noted for its rhododendrons because it's on limey soil. It's got a cold climate, but actually it even grows in, in, in formal gardens um, at, at Borough Castle. So, um, and as Matthew said, bred at um, Highclere in 1826, cross between um, Arboreum and, and, and Pontcom. It's a good plant, really is a good plant. Um, Planted, uh, we think the original um, plant arrived here just before the Great Famine, but actually our earliest rhododendron uh, planted in the garden in Kilmacurra is the, the oldest of the, of the rhododendron gardens in Ireland. It's back, right back as far as 1820. It's the tallest rhododendron in Britain and Ireland. Um, 
and its rhododendron arboreum, probably collected in Kathmandu Valley in, in the 1820s. So as you've seen from Matthew's talk, it's just great history. Thomas Thompson's collections arrived here, Joseph Hooker's collections. Um, and if you look to that plant book at Glasnevin, it's a who's who of horticultural um, um, sort of the famous names of horticulture today, George Forrest, Frank Indian Ward, they're all, they're all in there. So that's really why actually um, the idea of Rhododendron Week, which is something that, that's Mary's um, sort of brainchild, was to, it's a way for us to, to celebrate this great Rhododendron collection um, here. And we're really pleased to have had Matthew as our first keynote speaker. And as Mary will tell you, we're hoping to have it as an annual event. And in future, on site, I mean, the important thing, of course, is, you know, I, I think the inspiration uh, is, is a wonderful idea to share uh, the wonders of Kilmacurra, because if there were 193 of you walking around the gardens with us, you wouldn't have heard at the back. <laughs> and just if there's, say for people, you know, who are listening in, who are only starting to get an interest in rhododendrons, is there any from both of you, is there any favorite rhododendron you have or that what that you would recommend um, for somebody starting out to grow? Seamus, what are you going to suggest? OK, well, actually, do you know what, what I'll say is that I know that we've got um, probably a lot of viewers that are gardening on limey soil and then we do have people who are gardening on acid soil. So obviously, those of us who are on acid soil were absolutely spoiled. Um, you know, you're almost afraid to say in gardening circles, I'm on acid soil and I'm by the sea because it really is showing off. But for anybody who is in trickier conditions, if you're sort of inland and you're on, on limey soil, um, one of my great favourites is Rhododendron augustinii, named for Augustine Henry. And it's in bloom by the pond at the moment here at Kilmacara. It's this incredible blue shade. And Glass 11 has a pH of 7.9, and it will even grow without any sort of soil preparation. You know, we grew it on the Chinese slope at, at Glass 11. So if you're in an area where you think you can't grow rhododendrons, now you can get modern day grafted varieties that will tolerate. But if you plant rhododendron augustinii, it's glorious. All that Triflorum subseries are easy to grow anyway compared to the big grandis sub subsection. Um, so rhododendron augustinii would be one of my great favourites. And if you ever get today rhododendron species botanical gardens in Federal Way outside of Seattle, they have an entire walk of it. It is spectacular. But my own personal choice has to be rhododendron grande. And it's just because I live here on the estate and it's just this gigantic gigantic huge um 35 feet bush um and it kickstarts the rhododendron season here at Kilmacara. not just that you can see from tonight's talk that it was raised we know the exact date the 22nd of april 1850 the seed came in from kew it had been collected by a young joseph hooker in the himalaya david moore brought it down here in 1862 was writing to uh, joseph hooker in 1867 and when it was planted here in 1862 its sister seedlings were being grown at, by Charles Darwin, by Florence Nightingale. There's a sister seedling still alive at Logan House in, which is next door to the garden that Richard Baines manages. And Richard, I know you're you're, you're sitting and watching this evening. We're looking forward to your talk. So um, for the masses, I would choose Rhododendron Augustinii. For those of you who have a very well sheltered garden, lots of space, deep brown earth, acidic, good climate, Rhododendron Grande. Yeah. Mary, what about you? And to be really careful, Alta Clarenci as a, yeah. Yeah. As a reliable, an old reliable. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. I'm Augustinia all the way. I absolutely adore it. And yeah. in, in bloom now at the end of the pond there, it, Kilmacurra, it is spectacular. But gorgeous. I'm also a Nivium girl. Oh, great. I adore Nivium. Really, and one, really one of the exciting things about a plant is it's not just what you're looking at and enjoying and smelling, but it's it's like an open book because there's a story behind it. And and I think, you know, those of us who have spent half a lifetime working with plants know that thrill of the history behind it, uh, who has used it for what it's been bred from, but also almost daydreaming about going back to where it, because I'm sure that every time, Seamus, you're by the Grandy, your mind, it takes you straight back to the Himalayan hills and standing. It does, yes. 
when it comes into bloom here, our plant is huge. It's the largest cultivated captive specimen in Europe. But I remember trekking up towards um, Gojila and Rob Wilson Wright, we'd, we'd left the main group and we were um, just heading, you could see Captain Junga in, in the near distance, but there was Magnolia Campbelli, 120 feet overhead, and there was Grande, but then Grande, 70 feet tall overhead. Wow. So when when I come back to Kilmacora, it's lovely to see Hooker's original specimen, but it almost feels like being in a zoo because there's just one of it there. Whereas in the Sikkim Himalaya, you see forests, you know, and, and, and partly because it's what's termed sort of a big house rhododendron. You know, you need lots of room for it. Um, and uh, and Kilmacora is that classic big house uh, sort of rhododendron garden. Yeah. 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 Personally, I think Kilmacora is very much a sweet shop for rhododendron because there's just something to suit everybody, you know, size wise. But the grande has to be seen. Grande is lovely. But of course, everybody will have a different take on it because I know that um, Mark Bobin and Wendelin Morrison are watching in saving and they're down in Minturn, which is a fabulous rhododendron garden. And um, I'm sure if you were to ask both of them what their favorite rhododendrons would be, they'll say something different. So it depends on where you're gardening and where you are. And of course, the history behind your, your rhododendrons too. Yeah. And that was the awful thing. Uh, sorry, Matthew, to break across you. There was a slight bit of snobbery amongst the Actons uh, here at Kilmacurra and the Walpoles at Mount Dusher. So the Actons all stated they got their rhododendrons from Basnevin and Q, you know, from people like Joseph Hooker and Thomas Thompson. And the poor old Walpoles had to buy their rhododendrons at Mount Dusher. So <laughs> that's historic. We don't take like that nowadays. But just, just going back to Mark and Wendelin, tomorrow um and just to reiterate you know we are so delighted to be collaborating with the rhs rhododendron camellia magnolia society but tomorrow's video story is with mark and wendelin and that will be up hopefully on our youtube channel around 12 just after 12 noon so just to give them both a shout out yeah and i hope yes we we can hope that next year you will be able to to visit uh, Kilmacara in person and just going back really to the fact that there are over 180 species of rhododendron we grow there there are uh, in excess of 400 um, different cultivars and variations so the diversity on the site is breathtaking and yeah. something to behold personally I'd just like to thank yourself Matthew and you Seamus for the astonishing work you've, work you've both put in for this week with the online um the video stories and your talks as well and um we can't not mention richard and logan so we're all looking forward to seeing him but seamus matthew thank you so much for all not at all a pleasure and as i say all our opw colleagues in the background who have been so good to us yeah yeah and of course we should say as well that if you are keen on rhododendrons and you sort of want to increase your knowledge of it that the rhs the rhododendron camellia magnolia group it it is open to everybody for membership i'm the irish branch chair so if you need more information either contact myself or have a look on the rhs rhododendron camellia magnolia group website um and and uh, you can see all of the application uh, details there yeah, and the, the it's sorry, excuse me. The um the website has absolutely fantastic information on rhododendrons as well. Okay, guys. Great. Great. Hooray for rhododendrons. <laughs> Go and enjoy the lovely evening that's there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again, Matthew, for a great, Not great at all. No. Thanks for stepping in, Seamus. So lovely to have you both. My pleasure. Okay. Great.